Hey everyone, Mr. Jeffersonian here. And if you haven't heard about Anchor, let me explain. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. First off, it's free, and who doesn't like that? There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So the call to action is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Howdy, everyone, and thank you again for tuning in to another episode of the Jeffersonian Tradition. Before we get started, there are a few things I need to cover. If you find value in the podcast, then please consider becoming a supporting listener. Recurring contributions can be made through the supporting listener link in the show notes page. If you're not comfortable with recurring contributions, then one-time donations can be sent through Cash App to the show's cash tag, which is dollar sign Mr. Jeffersonian. And speaking of supporting listeners, the show gained its newest supporter over the weekend. Samantha, the homeschooling mother from Virginia, is our newest supporter, and she is a hero in her own right. She is fighting the good fight against the insidious public schooling system, and she is truly a scholar and a lady. Thank you so much for your support, Samantha. And Samantha is also a member of the show's private MeWe group, so if you want to have awesome discussions with folks like her then you need to download the MeWe app and send me a contact request so I can send you the invitation for the show's group. And one last thing I want to let the audience know, y'all are awesome. The show reached 30 plays in a single day for the first time on August 2nd, so please continue to tune in and share it with your friends and family, and I really do appreciate that. With all of that fun stuff said, let's turn our attention to today's subject. The man who once stated, I am an aristocrat. I love liberty. I hate equality. John Randolph of Roanoke. We're going to do this somewhat chronologically, so we're going to start off by looking at some of his early years and then just kind of progress from there. So y'all have heard me make references to Randolph in several episodes, and I want to use the next two episodes to give this incredible man his due. We'll start with a quick synopsis of his rearing, and then we'll look at what made him so important as part of American history. Randolph was born in 1773, the son of John Randolph of Matoax. If I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. Anybody from Virginia, feel free to correct me. And Francis Tucker. The elder John Randolph would die when his son was only five years old, and his mother would eventually get remarried to none other than St. George Tucker, who was one of the best defenders of states' rights and the compact theory who ever lived. And in my opinion, this definitely explains part of why Randolph himself would go on to be such a staunch advocate of states' rights. Now, the family suffered drastic losses during the War for American Independence, and young John Randolph was strongly influenced to see debt as a shackle. Into adulthood, his family was heavily indebted to English creditors, but he never once blamed the creditors. He blamed the people who took on the debt. So, at some point when he was a little kid, Randolph seems to have contracted tuberculosis or some other type of disease that prevented him from going through puberty in a normal manner. So, as an adult, he was described as having a high-pitched soprano speaking voice, and he was never able to grow facial hair. After this, either as a severe hypochondriac or truly suffering from differing maladies, Randolph would spend much of the rest of his life claiming to be assaulted by bad health at every turn, and eventually, as a form of self-medication, he would turn to alcohol and opium, and that only served to exacerbate whatever health problems he had. Now, when Randolph was 15, his stepfather sent him to college in New York, and he was already concerned with limiting his expenses. Can you all imagine that, a 15-year-old caring about keeping his living expenses light while he's off to college? He wrote a letter home stating, quote, Be well assured, my dear sir, our expenses since our arrival here have been enormous and by far greater than our estate, especially loaded as it is with debt, can bear. 
However, I flatter myself, my dear Papa, that upon looking over the accounts, you will find that my share is by comparison trifling, and hope that by the wise admonitions of so affectionate a parent, and one who has our welfare and interest so much at heart, we may be able to shun the rock of prodigality upon which so many people continually split, and by which the unhappy victim is reduced not only to poverty, but also to despair in all the horrors attending it. End quote. So again, can you imagine a 15-year-old talking like this today? Uh, Randolph was essentially saying that hopefully once his education was complete, the family would be able to escape the pitfall of debt that so many sink into in despair. So a very uh, wise young man, to, to say the least, because I, I can tell you when I was 15, I, I didn't care. If I had money in my pocket, that was money to burn. Now, Randolph didn't really... He he did well in school while he was there, but he never actually graduated. And it seems that uh, in many cases he would get into arguments with his teachers and instruct them on all the ways that they were wrong in, in his view. So uh, he he does seem to be a very headstrong individual, even even early on. So he never actually formally graduated. That being said, he was elected to his first term in the House of Representatives at the ripe old age of 26 in 1799, and he came to power at the dawn of the Jeffersonian Re Revolution, which saw the Federalists greatly diminished in power and influence at the general level of government. This will be more important later on, but during this time, traditional Virginia was also rapidly declining. John Taylor of Caroline wrote about the degradation of the soil and Randolph bemoaned the degradation of the people. Virginia, since its original colonial charter in 1607, had been an extremely aristocratic society, and the Randolphs were one of the original families to settle in Virginia, and John Randolph of Roanoke was one of the last of a dying breed when it came to the natural aristocracy. So what were his political beliefs? Well, Randolph was heavily influenced by the ultra-conservative Edmund Burke, and being a gentleman of Virginia, he believed strongly in the concept of hegemonic liberty. And for those of you not familiar with hegemonic liberty, um, basically that's a belief that more highly independent members of society should be entitled to higher levels of liberty, including being the master of those around them. And no, that did not mean just slaves. So they saw the natural aristocracy as, as the people best fit to lead the society in general. Now, granted, a, a lot of that natural aristocracy, yes, they did own slaves, but that's not specifically what was being referenced here. However, this liberty did come with a cost, and the ideal Virginia gentleman, while being master of all around him, was at the same time a slave of his duty. And this often led, again, to the gentleman class taking on prominent roles in politics. So with this understanding, we can more clearly understand how it was that a slaveholding society such as Virginia seemed to produce some of the most fierce libertarian-leaning political figures. Throughout his political career, Randolph also believed strongly in the decentralist principles of Thomas Jefferson at the federal level, even when Jefferson himself abandoned them while in office. However, Randolph did not follow Jefferson's conclusion all the way down to the level of ward republics. And as mentioned earlier, Randolph was once famously quoted as saying that I am an aristocrat, I love liberty, I hate equality. So after the horrors of the French Revolution, Randolph developed a strong distrust of too much democracy and entrenched himself in the mindset that having a natural aristocratic class would produce people who jealously guarded their liberties at all cost. And as a benefit, these freedoms would also filter down to the lower classes, but they would not be given political power via suffrage to directly change these practices under Randolph's worldview. And here we have to pause and ask, is that a good thing? Is that a worldview worth preserving? Is that a, wor a worldview at least worth giving a reconsideration? Well, obviously, I don't think anyone should be a slave. That said, I also don't think there should be universal suffrage. When people who are dependent on the government, be that through welfare or government employment, are allowed to vote, they have a vested interest in expanding their benefits at the expense of everybody else who's not on the dole. And this is true at the general level and the state level. And there's a book, it's uh, called Democracy, the God That Failed, written by Hans Hermann Hoppe. And I would recommend everybody give, give that book a read. It's actually a compilation of essays, but I would recommend everybody give that a read if you haven't done so already. But Hoppe argues that monarchy was actually a less oppressive system than democracy, specifically because it created such a sharp distinction of the haves and the have-nots of society. So people were always naturally... Um, 
suspicious of, of the monarch and any any time they wanted to raise taxes or any time they wanted to go to war, people were just naturally more suspicious. And Hoppo thinks that the United States would be freer if they were fractured into 10,000 Liechtensteins. So Liechtenstein, for those who don't know, uh, is actually the last, I, I think the last monarchy left in Europe. Uh, they're a teeny tiny micro state. They are situated between Switzerland and Austria. So that's that's Hoppe's worldview is that we should decentralize down to that level. And that's actually sort of in line with, with Jefferson's idea of Ward Republic. So definitely some things that we have to ask ourselves. I know some of these questions may not be comfortable, but definitely things worth considering like, hey, do we want a society where every single person has the ability to vote and just kind of take it from there? And I don't I don't think, again, if we ever did see the reemergence, which I don't think we will, but if we ever did see the reemergence of voting restrictions, I don't think it should be based on race or anything like that. For me, I would say either we need to have some sort of property ownership qualifier or the person has to be a net taxpayer, one of the two. So not a racial element, just a sense of, people who can be somewhat independent and not totally reliant on getting everything from the government. So what are some of Randolph's career highlights? So Randolph was disgusted by the Yazoo land scandal. And in brief, this was a real estate fraud perpetuated by Georgia Governor George Matthews and the Georgia General Assembly. They colluded to sell Georgia's Western lands to political insiders at rock bottom prices and strangely enough, many of these insiders were New Englanders who were looking to profit on Southern land speculation. Once the people of Georgia found out about this fraud, they booted out the corrupt state legislature and rescinded all of the land sales that had taken place. Randolph supported the actions of the citizens of Georgia, calling out the horrendous levels of corruption in the government. But unfortunately, this would be the first time that some of the other leading Jeffersonians compromised their principles. James Madison and Jefferson himself were willing to accept a compromise wherein the state of Georgia would simply cede control of these lands to the trust of the general government for a paltry sum of $1.25 million and then allow the general government to sell the land off as they would. Northern speculators did not let the issue die, however. They, They did not want to accept their losses. So they kept the issue alive for 12 years and kept making appeals to the general government via the Supreme Court. And finally, that usurpatory Supreme Court headed by John Marshall ruled in favor of the speculators in the case Fletcher v. Peck in 1810. And that, that case was bad for several reasons. That was, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the first time that a state law was actually just outright overturned by the um, Supreme Court. So that, that, it was a bad outcome all around because it, it further expanded the powers of the general government via a judicial uh, activist on the bench, and it just a bad situation all around. And Randolph would never forgive Jefferson for compromising his principles on this issue. And as a result, he actually set up a small opposition faction within the House of Representatives that we now know as the Tertium Quids. Randolph was also the lead prosecutor in the impeachment trial against Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase in 1804. In this case, Chase was an openly partisan judge. He was a Federalist judge, and the Jeffersonians saw his impeachment as the only method for holding radical judicial members accountable. And that was the promise sold to them in support of ratifying the Constitution, after all, because the anti-Federalists, Jeffersonians, whatever you want to call them, almost to a man, they were actually very afraid of having a federal judiciary at all. And and they were worried that, hey, if we have this, you're going to have situations where uh, state laws can be invalidated. And you're going to have situations where, where the states are taken over through the judiciary. And people like Alexander Hamilton and the other Federalists are, um, they are, well, other supporters of the Constitution, maybe not necessarily Federalists, but they assured the Jeffersonians or the anti-federalist over and over again that that would not be the case. And here we are, you know, just about not even 20 years after the ratification and, and it's already happening. So that Fletcher v. Peck was, was a very bad outcome. Or excuse me, the failure to remove Samuel Chase in 1804 was a very bad outcome. Now, ultimately, the Senate refused to convict Chase and the Jeffersonians looked on the federal judiciary in utter disgust. And this opened the door for John Marshall to go full on down the nationalist path and expand the powers of the general government again through judicial activism. 
John Randolph also opposed the War of 1812 as an unjust war of aggression and somewhat prophetically was quoted, quote, I have said on a former occasion, and if I were Philip, I would employ a man to say it every day, that the people of this country, if ever they lose their liberties, will do it by sac sacrificing some great principle of free government to temporary passion, end quote. And this proved to be true because this war would ultimately be a major blow against Jeffersonian principles as it produced a short-lived ultra-nationalist feeling within the country, now known as the era of good feelings. And so Randolph rightfully saw like, hey, you know, if, if we cede authority to the general government to make war as it sees fit, then what's the point of all this? Because the, the states are going to be reduced and prostrated and we're, we're just going to be left with, with a big national conglomeration. And that, in my opinion, has definitely proven to be true, not only for that war, but I mean, you look at the wars that we've been involved with over the last, I don't know, on and off over the last 80 or so years. And I, I think Randolph has been proven right. And during the War of 1812, Randolph refused to compromise on his principles and made some strange allies, namely the Federalist. So again, the Federalists were like the ultra-nationalist. Um, however, because of circumstances, Randolph found himself in alliance with them, even though he despised them on principle. Uh, he allied with them during the War of 1812 because they actually um, disavowed the war as well, or, or they did not support the war either. So it, it's kind of interesting to see how these alliances within the general government developed and fell apart. But the Federalists mainly opposed the war on commercial grounds as the conflict destroyed much of their shipping industry. And once the war had passed, the aforementioned nationalist feelings and the implosion of, of the Federalist Party left Randolph alone in the wilderness and, and his influence in the House greatly diminished. Undeterred, Randolph would spend hours in rambling speeches against whatever the nationalist measure of the day was, until at last, his humiliation was complete when he lost his seat in the election of 1813. However, this was not to be the last that the country would see of old John Randolph of Roanoke, as he was re-elected in a landslide in the election of 1815, and actually that's, that's a somewhat interesting uh, turn of events there. Randolph, the person that he ran against, I, I can't remember his name right offhand right now. But um, anyway, that person went on to D.C. Uh, he came back at some point to Virginia and was trying to electioneer. And Randolph actually pretty much hemmed him up and started asking him all kinds of questions about current political events. And the guy basically had no clue what was going on. A lot of people saw this and the, the dude was just totally embarrassed by Randolph. And then again, Randolph won his reelection in, in a landslide in 1815. So that's kind of an interesting turn of events there. And upon going back to DC, Randolph immediately resumed his ardent defense of states' rights. And it was around this time he had started imbibing to excess. At this point, he was described by his slaves and even many of his constituents as being Wild Jack Randolph, a man who could see devils on the stairs and fancy dead men writing in the next room with powers more than human. So in this light, there was a debate in 1816 wherein the general government was trying to pass massive appropriations for internal improvements, and they wanted to keep the taxation system from the War of 1812 in place basically as a permanent source of revenue. And there was a young nationalist from South Carolina who rose to challenge Randolph's opposition to the measures as, un as unconstitutional. And this young South Carolinian would claim that federally financed roads and canals were measures to provide for the enduring national defense of the country and that the nation must prepare for war in times of peace. Randolph turned his flickering gaze to this young South Carolinian and perhaps identified the man destined to be his political disciple thereafter. Pointing his bony finger at the young man, Randolph solemnly instructed him to penetrate deeper into the mysteries of politics and that one must judge of political measures by their distant but immense effects. Randolph continued stating, quote, I have long believed there was a tendency in the administration of this government and the system itself indeed to consolidation and the remarks made by the honorable gentleman from South Carolina have not tended to allay any fears I have entertained from that quarter. Our government is a government of states confederated together, but the doctrines put forth go to prostrate the state governments at the feet of the general government, end quote. And the man that Randolph was pointing to was John C. Calhoun. 
We're going to go ahead and wrap it up here for today. On the next episode, we will explore the impacts that John Randolph had by teaching his doctrine to Calhoun and a few other Southern statesmen, and conclude by studying Randolph's response to the actions of Andrew Jackson during the nullification crisis and the Virginia Constitutional Convention of 1829. Thanks everyone again for tuning in. Please remember if you find value in the podcast to consider contributing to the show. You can contribute on a recurring basis through the supporting listener link in the show notes page, or you can make a one-time contribution by using the show's cash app information, which is also included in that show notes page. Any contribution amount helps, and thank you again to everyone in advance who decides to do so. Also, please consider downloading the MeWe app and joining the show's private group so we can have more sane discussion around historical and current political issues. And all right, with another episode in the books, thank you again for tuning in, and I'll talk to you all next time.